Take five. Five questions to authors and artists. With a common question, we get a personal perspective on what shapes their views. I'm joined here at the London Book Fair with Stephanie Bond. Welcome to Audiobook Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to ask you if there was a book that inspired you to write. Books, actually. There's a series that probably inspired a lot of people to write, certainly to read a lot of books, the Nancy Drew Mystery Series. Um, I probably started reading them when I was eight or so, and I just loved them, probably because there were so many of them, and I loved revisiting the characters, and, um, and I had all of them. I collected all of them on my bookshelf, and I read them again and again and again, and, and looking back, that's probably where I gathered my storytelling rhythm, is from reading all of those books so many times. And now I write mysteries, and so I don't think that's any coincidence. I yeah. think that's, that all goes back to Nancy Drew. Absolutely. It's an incredible how impressionable it is when you're young. Because also, uh, for those who are not familiar with your work, you do write series of books and it's mm -hmm. the same characters. Yeah, mystery series. And my, my series, Body Movers, is set in Atlanta. And it's uh, a brother and a sister who, uh, she works at Neiman Marcus during the day and she helps her brother move bodies from crime scenes by night. And it's the two of them and their stories, their personal stories, and then their body moving capers. Uh, that carry the mysteries along and I have eight books in the series now and so I love going back and visiting those characters again. Because in the UK I don't really think we have Nancy Drew, I mean we know of her mm -hmm. and the fact that it was a series but I mean presumably each time Nancy Drew had a adventure and was she like the detective that kind of she was, and she them had all. a couple of best friends, Bess and oh my goodness I can't, oh um Let's see, Bess, and was it George? I think she had a girlfriend named George. I can't believe I can't remember these two friends of hers. You were allowed. It was uh, a while ago, eight yeah, years it, old. Yeah, it was. But, uh, but anyway, there were the three of them, and then there were three boys that they came into contact with occasionally. They were the sort of pseudo-boyfriends at the time. Uh, but yeah, they were always. Her, her father was a, uh, an attorney, and he was a single father which is unusual, mm. and uh, so she got drawn into these mysteries, and he kind of helped her out a little bit, and then she had a housekeeper, Hannah, who kind of watched over her and tried to keep her out of trouble, so it was wonderful fun at that age, absolutely, mm. and I think, am, am I, does Cherry Ames sound familiar, because I want to say that was an English series, English set series. I'm not familiar with no, her. She was a nurse. I mean, I would call a nurse that solved mysteries. It doesn't even I ring think. any bells to me. Oh my goodness, my memory. So, of course, this was a long time ago for me. But have you heard of Enid Blyton? No. That's who we had. Mm -hmm. She wrote books called The Secret Seven and The Famous Five, mm -hmm. and they were the same five people oh, or the same okay. seven, and they, yeah. you know, discovered. Similar. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much so. Mm -hmm. We all grew up on that. So, is there a book that you wish you had written? I wish I'd written. There was a, another book that I read when I was 14 or so, 13, 14, that was um, influential. It was called Christie, written by Catherine Marshall. And that was a, a book about a, a young woman who goes into a rural Tennessee to, well, she goes to sort of evangelize and convert rural people, poor people, into her religion. And instead, she's changed by them. It's uh, the opposite of what she expected. And she kind of becomes a woman while she's on this mission. And I rem I've read that book, and I've recommended it to so many young girls. It's just a great book for that sort of coming-of-age story and, um, and just this wonderful adventure that this young woman goes on. She mm -hmm. gives up a, uh, a, a very um, uh, sort of a luxurious life to go do this. And I just remember thinking that was my first... Um, inkling of that maybe I should go out, strike out, and do things on my own, and and it changed me so much that I always wish I could write a book like that. And I've recommended it to so many young girls. Mm -hmm. It's still on my shelf, actually, at home, and I keep copies of it just so I can give it away. Oh so wow! Yeah, Christy it's by yeah. Catherine Marshall. It's a great yeah, I'm going to check that out. Great book. Can I just pick up on what you said about she 
became a woman? Do you mean like sort of sexualized? Like oh no, it was a very sweet book. It's very, um, it's actually a sort of an inspirational book. Um, it's got uh, some religion in the background of the, of the book and um, it's, it's very sweet and chaste. But she goes there, um, sort of a 14, 15 year old, I forget exactly how old she is, um, but she then sort of matures emotionally because she was so naive and sheltered in the life that she had and she's educated by these people and she sees them struggle and she just sort of becomes more worldly and aware and uh, so she does you know, mature into a woman while she's there mm-hmm. helping them. It's just yeah. a great book. It's a thick book which I loved at that age, you know, having to live with it for, you know, several weeks mm. and uh, just one of those immersive experiences. Yeah, and I can see as a teenager why it's so important because there is that feeling as you're growing up that mm-hmm. people aren't always telling you the truth and things aren't exactly what they seem mm-hmm. and, you know, you go into certain things thinking one mm-hmm. set of pre Normally, they are preconceptions mm-hmm. that are often totally wrong totally about wrong. yourself right. and about life around. Mm-hmm. Good one. Do you into audiobooks? Like, is there a book you would like read to you? I love audiobooks. I live in Atlanta in the United States, and the traffic in Atlanta, I think it's second only to L.A. Uh, it's mm-hmm. so bad in Atlanta. Everyone's commute is about an hour. That's an mm-hmm. average commute each way. Now, um, I don't commute because I work from my home office, but I spend a lot of time in traffic just trying to get around the city. So Atlanta is a huge market for audiobooks. Mm-hmm. And I love audiobooks just because there's so many books that I can't get time to read, but I've found that if I listen to a book during the day while I'm doing the laundry or doing, you know, chores around my condo that I can get caught up and I love being read to. And um uh, I'd say the, the books that I would most like to have read to me that haven't been, if anyone wants to volunteer, are the Austen books because mm. I'm the person who collected all of those books, the complete works of Jane Austen, but I can't read them and get the appreciation for them that I know I would have you know, if I could hear the words being read and mm-hmm. much more lyrical. And, uh, and I don't like the sound of my own voice, so it's not something I could read aloud and would have the same experience. So, yeah, I would love to hear Pride and Prejudice and um, uh, all of them. You know, I've got, I've got the entire works. They're probably thick, probably a foot of, of books on my shelf that wow. I just can't get through. Mm. Have you tried her poetry? No. She wrote quite a, well, not huge amounts, but she wrote quite a few poems. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Because it does sort of mean that the words on the page and novels kind of scan and they sit kind of quite nicely and they are quite lyrical aren't they? yeah so can I just say I mean we love your voice but does it mean when you're reading like a, a book like that or a book that you know is very much an English author mm-hmm. does the internal voice that goes on when you're reading it is it an American voice or can you actually hear it in an English voice because I, I listen to American books all the time and I feel like I'm listening to them with all the accents, you know, picked up from yeah. zillions of years of Hollywood. And yeah, exactly. TV I hear that probably from Sense and Sensibility and from the movies. And uh, yeah, I hear the English accent. The mm. other is my first agent was uh, English, and she had, of course, a lovely, beautiful, wonderful voice and accent. And I think I probably hear her voice when I read. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's when quite I read nice. English set books. Uh huh. And do you think there's any content that doesn't belong between the covers of a book? Hmm. Um, hmm. That doesn't belong between the covers of a book. I would say um, the only thing that I've ever read that bothered me that I thought, you know, maybe should have been left out of a book and maybe was better imagined is things that are over-explained. You know, things that there are too many adjectives or too much, like there's too much author intrusion and I don't get to imagine and enjoy things. Um, but I think every story and, and every situation, you know, has its application to the book. I just can't imagine um, that. Um, but I do believe the storytelling becomes more alive on audio because you've got 
music that you can add, uh, even if it's not on the tape of the book you're listening to, lots of times I'll listen to music while I'm listening to an audiobook mm -hmm. as well for my own background music. Right. And um, there's just so much more. Um, it's almost like it frees up your senses. If you're not reading, then it, it, you have uh, the ability to use every other sense. You know, it sort of is an independent mm. uh, experience and just so much more rich than if you just read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Finally, um, in the days before print, do you think you would have been a storyteller? So I... Um, in the days before the printing press, um, I, I, I'm not sure I could have been very productive with a quill and ink, but, um, and you know, I'm really not much of a talker, so I would like to think that I was, would, probably just because if there was no other way to express myself, I probably would have been, but um, I have to say that speaking a story is, isn't my natural it certainly isn't my natural turn now. But I probably would have been, yeah, the person following the storyteller around, you know, the community storyteller. I would have been that person. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe. Yeah, I, I could see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's it's bred in us. I think we're words people, whether we speak them or read them, you know, we're just somehow we gravitate to words, writers and readers do and um, no matter what form. Stephanie Bond, I'm definitely looking forward to more of your stories. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.